What's up, you savages? It's Tuesday, the 27th of February. The check-in is brought to you by Lucy. Let me ask you something. You ready for a party in your mouth? Well, let Lucy in. Lucy Breakers nicotine pouches have tiny flavor capsules inside them. Pop one in, break the capsule, and get the party started, Jack, with flavors like mint, mango, berry citrus, and espresso. No matter what you like, Lucy has something that you'll love. Listen, so far, I've tried the mint and the berry citrus. Tremendous. Here's the beauty about Lucy. You can get two milligrams is perfect if you don't use nicotine a lot. Eight milligrams will get you going if you use nicotine daily. But they got 12 milligrams for when you really need a quick pick-me-up. You know what I'm saying? So those other brands of pouches just don't do the trick. Listen, do me a favor. Let's level up your nicotine routine with Lucy. Go to lucy.co slash joey. Go to lucy.co slash joey and press in code joey to get 20% off your first order. That's 20%. And Lucy offers free shipping and has a 30-day refund policy if you change your mind. That's lucy.co slash joey. And use code Joey, to get 20% off and always free shipping. Now, here comes the fine print. Lucy products are only for adults of legal age, and every order is age verified. Warning, the product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. And you know what? That's it, and that's that. Again, go to lucy.co slash Joey. Use code Joey and get 20% off and always free shipping. The check-in is also brought to you by, listen, this is a party-type episode. It's brought to you by Blue Chew. Listen, if you're soft, don't be hard on yourself. Get back in the game with Blue Chew. Uncle Joey, what's Blue Chew? Oh, tremendous. Blue Chew offers the same ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, all at a fraction of a cost. You go to the doctor lately and try to get a prescription for Viagra, you know what they what they want? They want like $80 a pill. No, 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 no. Get ready to save tons of money and have awesome sex. I'm talking about doing backflips, listening to stuff, breaking windows. Blue Chew will also send the ED medicine straight to your door. And listen, I don't even know why they call it ED medicine. They should be calling it love medicine, Jack. Blue Chew is totally online, and you'll get a digital consultation with a physician, a doctor. And then everything is sent. Right to you in a discreet package. Does it work? Tremendously. You pop a blue chew uh, 20 minutes before you want to get the party started, and it's all over. You might as well put a cape on that fucking thing because you're knocking down walls like, I don't know, like who. Anyway, blue chew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at bluechew.com. Listen, you know what that little motto is? Chew it and then do it. Ha, 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 ha. Blue Chew got a special deal for check-in listeners. Try Blue Chew free, free on a Tuesday. Press in code Joey at checkout and just pay $5 for shipping. Who's better than you? Nobody. BlueChew.com, promo code Joey to receive your first order free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. Thank you, Blue Chew, for sponsoring the podcast. Why safety information? They're going to tell you things you got to get if you're going to eat a blue chew, like a helmet, stuff like that, like a first aid kit, because you look at Lee's. Look at, anyway, bluechew.com, promo code Joey to receive your first month. Now back to the check-in. Turn off your TVs, run for your lives. It's over. They didn't put you on this planet just to give up. If Uncle Joey could do it, I could rule the world. That's what you gotta be thinking. Welcome back to show! Yo! Hey, buddy. What's happening, you bet? Hey, buddy. What the fuck? What's wrong with you with that? Hey, buddy. What am I supposed to say? We're gonna go fucking play goldfish or something. Hey, buddy. I've been playing nothing but goldfish. This is the check in, motherfucker. Tuesday, February 27. You come correct. What's that shit, fucking? Hey, buddy. What's going on there, Tarzan? 
That's what I always say. We have an extra day this year. That pisses you off when you like when you work a day job. The extra day, I'm fucking pissed. We have an extra day this year. It's the 29th. We only get one every four years. You call in sick. No big fucking. Oh, you can't call in. (laughs) Yes, you can. It's leap year. I ain't got time. It's bad luck. (laughs) Fucking, you gonna worry about? Why are you killing me with this shit for? This is the only year we have an extra day. Who? You think people are jumping up and down? I got an extra day. Well, yeah. yeah. It fucking it when yeah I I bet they are holy shit uh, no I'm doing good buddy how are you how was your weekend tip top magoo was a very fucking nice weekend you know that I had a nice weekend with the girls relaxing no drama got on stage Thursday night as usual nice and, how'd it go and, uh, Friday went out to this restaurant char okay Red Bank one of the chefs trained jiu jitsu over there I got listen. Where I trained as two chefs, Steakhouse 85 and motherfucking Char. What kind of food is Char? Char is a steakhouse. Oh, shit. And then Steakhouse 58, 85 is obviously a steak lobster. But I took my wife to Red Bank. It's like 35 minutes from here. It's a whole different fucking fat man city, Lee. It's a restaurant row of fat men will die. But I went to this place Friday night. Okay. It was Friday, so it was Lent. So I was a little confused when I walked in there. <laughs> but then I made it work. Chef Phil fucking prepared these little yellowtail sushi tacos, little ones. Right. Oh, my God. And he had some lobster fucking uh, dumplings. Nice. Not Chinese style, like white people style. What and a white people had, style. I don't know. And then he had like... <laughs> He sent over some calamari, really good. And then I was full. I was stuffed. But my wife got the uh, short rib. Oh, I love short rib. Oh, but gnocchi with a garlic cream sauce. And she only took two bites of it and brought it home. And we busted it out Saturday night. Lee, fucking amazing, that thing. I got to go back this week and get that dish. Just that dish with a glass of water. No bread, no fucking butter, no salad, just that dish. That's like, because when you're eating when you're fat, like, and you look at the menu, like, when you're eating when you're on a diet, it sucks. Like, you try to look for something. It's going to be okay, but it's not going to be great. Like, everything about that sounded good. Short rib, gnocchi, and the cream. There's nothing better than a cream sauce. Fucking I, great. My cat sucked the rest of it out of the fucking off the dishes. That's how good it was. The I cat. Just, I need some of that shit, dog. You put it down for the cat? Fuck yeah. That's nice. My caddy, that girl, I love her with all my heart. She's made, she came into my life a year before my daughter. Mm-hmm. I could tell she really dug me. I dug her. You know, she was in a fucking house with seven cats that wanted to kill her. (laughs) And she would fucking, like, take your chances, bitches. And she used to help, you know. It's really weird that my other cats at the time were very, uh, what do you call that? Like, they were already home cats. Like, Fidel, a mouse could pass by him, and he'll go, okay. You know, but Gray never stopped being a street cat. And I could see the differences. One Once set of cats were raised with a lot of love and they had, you know, food and shit. Mm -hmm. This bitch had been fighting for her life for three years outside. When we got her, she had just got attacked by a possum or something. When she went into that lion's den, she knew how to maneuver them. They couldn't even deal with her. She would jump on furniture over them. She'd get to a dish and then walk right past them. There was nothing they could do. And one by one, they disappeared and she kept hanging in there. And then once Evie passed, God rest her soul, it took her about two weeks to come downstairs. And now she's down here all the fucking time. I can't move my chair because I'll roll over her. So I got to look around before I even move my chair. Wow. She's around here all the time, sleeps with us, fucking just ate some of my Cuban steak sandwich. You know, she doesn't give a Frenchman's fuck. Have you thought about taking her out of the house? Would you ever bring her with you somewhere? No, I put her on the porch when I get sun. She sits out there with me like my fucking bodyguard. I know. She opens up. She gets the vitamin D. She lets the sun hit her stomach, and I'm right next to her. 
stone to the gills. Fucking this, beautiful son. This could be like not corny, but do you like relate to Gray? Like the way you were describing Gray made me think of you like a little bit. Do I relate to Gray? <clears throat> I don't know. I just think that uh, I, she's just been a great cat. She really is a great cat. You know, I told my wife the other day, I go, nobody gives me the love in this house that Gray gives me. You know what I'm saying? Like when I take a shower, Gray's there with her head in the heater. Mm -hmm. There's a vent that comes up and she'll lay on the fucking vent while I'm in the shower. I can see her from the sink. It's She's real close with me and I like it. I like her. You know, I like animals, man. Yeah. Like animals. My next venture is a dog, maybe a couple more cats like, to end this fucking journey. Because that's what people who get retired do. They get a dog. Now you can walk with them, go outside and feed them, take care of them, spoil them. They're like your fucking kid, you know? It's gonna be, Is it going to be strange to switch from cats to dogs? Like, aren't dogs like... No, no, I'm, still, I'm always going to have a cat in here. This oh, yeah. is fucking Central Jersey. I got trees all over me. I see a mouse. I'll fucking shit my pants. I'll sell the house. So there's always going to be a cat here. If the cat dies on Tuesday, there'll be a motherfucker in here by Thursday dropping cents. <laughs> Because you only have like a week before the scent disappears. Then the mice start coming. And there's field mice all around here. People Why will tell you, you like that? Enter, you'll get field mice. I'm like, I see a field mouse. I pack my bag. I go to the fucking Hampton Inn. <laughs> and the next day I get more cats in Disneyland. I put them here. And that's it. And that's that. I feel like you're not even joking. No, like, not are, you, are you afraid of mice? No, but the, the experience I had with mice as a chill as a child made me go, I'm never gonna put myself in that position again. What happened? When I was a kid, my fucking house in North Bergen got just oh yeah you know, with mice, these gray fucking mice. And they were everywhere. And I remember like I couldn't fucking walk in a room without turning on a light with a broom. Fuck yeah, that would be that would be too much. You're a kid that sticks with you forever. I still remember going to my attic to get like something in the attic, and they were fucking everywhere. And there was a row of just turds, like ten feet of turds, where they would walk back and forth. And I'm like, no, nah, I can't do this shit. This is not for me, Jack. So I always have a motherfucking cat in Miceville. Dude, what do they do? Because I've never had. I'm allergic. Do they like? When is it creepy to like see a dead mouse? Like, do they bring it to you? Like, isn't that isn't that scary? No, I don't have any hunters. I have okay. they're all hunters, but they stay in the fucking house. So, but if if I let Gray out and when I had Dimmy, they would bring home shit. You know, that's how they please you by bringing home shit. That's why when you leave, cats think you're going hunting. Because if they left, they're going hunting. So when you leave the house to go fucking. When you come back, they want to see that you're carrying shit because you're supposed to go hunting. I had no it's idea. A, it's a fucking different world. It's a it's such a intricate, different world of the cat and the dog and the animal and the pet. I wish I had more time. I wish I was 18 again and I would have fucking learned how to be a fucking mountain time. One of those fucking Zig Fleet and Roy type motherfuckers. How to tame a tiger and fucking... You know, sleep with him and pet his stomach. You know, I like him. And, you know, animals read you. Different. Listen, when I was a kid, I got always attacked. I always yeah. got attacked by dogs. And at a certain age, they just stopped. I just stopped getting attacked. That means I was a rotten little motherfucker, and the dogs knew it. But once my heart got pure, once I got hair around my dick, and I got my thoughts down, then me and dogs got along. Because I didn't get bit again after I was maybe like 11. Fuck. But I was getting bit every two fucking years. And were you like going at them or they just out of the blue? Yeah, yeah, I'm on going up to dogs with a two by four and telling them, come no, on. I'm come. not thinking to hit them. I'm like, I don't know, are you rubbing them? No. Or? They would walk up with a chain, whatever, and everybody would be standing around. And as the dog was pulling away, he'd come back and bite me in the ankle. I'm like, what the fuck did I even do? And that happened to me twice. <laughs> a dog walked past me with his owner and then he came back and bit me and then went back with his dope and pincher brother. I'm telling you, I had the worst. I got bit in the face in the Bronx. I got bit in the hand. You know, it was just a fucking nightmare. And then one day I stopped getting bit. All of a sudden, dogs like me? No. I stopped having fear in front of them. That's the real truth. 
my fear, you know, after you get bit three times, you're going to yeah. fear fucking dogs. So, you know, you have that fear and they know it and they bully you. It's like, you know, when you walk in a white man and a black name, when they're like, hey, honky, what's going on? And, you know, you just walk down the street. <laughs> I can't. I would love to get called honky. I I did my first sort of like it wasn't a black room, but like the guy I was opening for this weekend was was black, and so like he had like a like a mostly black audience. It was cool. It was a fun. It was a fun weekend. Listen, man, in a comedy setting, brothers are the best. But you got to be funny. Yeah, you got to be funny, and you better talk when in Rome. Okay, they don't mind. If you talk about them to their face, it was with a, smile, I, with a smile on your face. You could call a black person anything. I don't know about anything, but I'm it was. Dog, it, I've been there. You sexy bitch. Oh well, uh, yeah, we, that, we're saying that something like, bad pussy off you. That's offensive. You tell a chick you want to eat that Brillo pad pussy. That's <laughs> very offensive. I used to say it to their faces, and they'd start sweating in front of me, like, "Oh my god, he's gonna eat my pussy, this white motherfucker." That's a black girl's dream, you know, a fucking slave owner to eat that snack <laughs> you around with the hat. And can't trust it. Oh, I didn't do that. And it, cause I, I even asked the first night I did pretty well, but I have a joke that I haven't done in years about like I, I used to date a black girl. And I didn't know that some black girls wear wigs sometimes and I hadn't done it in a while. And I asked the headliner about it and he was, he was so cool about it. And then he actually gave me a way to get into it. And like, the first show I did, it's funny, um, you said, like, the black people are cool with it. The first show, I got half laughs, half groans, and the white people were the people groaning. Yes. And the second show was almost, not almost all, but a good amount black. And they it, it was like, I've never had this happen. That joke did so well that my usual closer didn't do well. I should have oh, closed on that one. Yeah, but you didn't know. You didn't know. That's how, if I would ever go up. And tell like a story, I couldn't follow it. Really? Like if I went up there and told like the hooker story or something at 20 minutes and I had 15, 20 minutes left, I couldn't follow it. If I'd said something about my mother on stage, but oh. I found it dead. That's why when I ever did the one man show, it wasn't going to work. After I brought my mother's death up, it just sailed along and I couldn't put it in the beginning, which was, I always really wanted to do, but that's a, that's a complete different chapter. I want to talk to you about something because there was two very interesting things that happened last week in okay. comedy mm -hmm. that really will affect comedy. Friday morning, a bunch of comics woke up from New York and yeah. they woke up to an email that they had been canceled. Gomez, Florentine, Kurt Metzger, Dave Landau, I think. Smith. Smith, Dave Smith. And it was a club by Capitol Hill, blah, 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 you know. And a couple people contacted me. What did you think? You were up in Seattle. What do you, you know. And I was in Seattle 29 years ago. I was walking around Seattle in 1985, 6, 7. Basically, because I left January of 2000, of 97. You know, in 23 years, in 20 years, the last 20 years, a lot of areas have changed demographically. And I hate to say it, half of these cities are getting, uh, are getting infiltrated with the people who get offended, those type of people. Gentrified. Yeah, with the dogs and the bullshit and the fucking, <laughs> you know. And everything is a dilemma, you know, and Seattle has been one of those places, you know, that the other side of town is shooting heroin and killing themselves. But the other side of town is fucking sensitive, you know, to no end, you know. And then so that was Friday morning. And then Saturday when I woke up, I was excited as a kid on Christmas. Yeah. Because I knew what was going to go down that night. I wasn't thinking about what happened Friday. I was so busy in my life with, the, with my daughter and we had to go somewhere. I was just excited for 1130. And I put that mother, me and my wife watched uh, 
his special because my wife had never known who Shane was. So I go, let's watch the special so you could see it. Which and one? Netflix? Came down and we all watched Saturday Night Live, except when my wife went up about midnight. But she watched this monologue. And it was so funny. It's like it reminded me when I used to be a thief. From the minute I knew I was robbing Lee's house, as soon as I got out of my car, I was on a complete mission to just steal. There was no that I think about how it affected my comedy, how it was the same mentality. Like I think about when I kidnapped Bella, when I went back to get the Coke, it didn't matter to me who was there. I was getting that fucking Coke. Right. I kicked that fucking door down like I owned it. And I went in there and I just took it out and I just got in my car and left. And I did a thousand, I did maybe 10 things where I got out of the car and I knew I had a mission. Nothing was going to stop me. I don't care if you had 10 locks on your door. I was taking your dog off the hinges. And then I would go in and even though you thought you hid the Coke or the money, I got it. That's just the way it was. And I'd walk out of there like I'd own it. And people, people from the area would look at the door like you just busted that dude's door. And walked in there and walked out. It didn't even matter to me. Because if I ran out of there, then I would get their attention. But I walked out like I was walking my dog. Like I was looking for Lulu. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I just went. I used to go deaf. That's what the whole point of this fucking You're like locked in. Yeah. When you get locked in, you go deaf. You You go deaf. Your ears ring. Whenever I would do something bad, my ears would ring. Whenever I get excited... My ears would ring. Saturday night, eleven thirty. My ears were ringing. Wow! Because I was so excited for Shane, because I knew what he was going to do. Listen, you know, I don't know. My wife just told me this morning that there was a lot of people bad mouthing his set and this and that. It really doesn't matter. You know what the fucking bottom line is? SNL had the highest ratings they had Saturday night for the last twenty years. Definitely. And everybody saw what I saw, that Shane was heads and tails above those people on that cast. Whatever anybody wants to say, that was real comedy. That was somebody who started in Philadelphia and worked himself in fucking shithole rooms and PA and wherever the fuck they go around here to fucking train. It's, you know, no picnic. And he, they fired him because he said some shit on a podcast. It's us cracking jokes, but you know people can't let nothing be with this, with this in this world. You got a job tomorrow, Lee? They're gonna bring up clips from the church. Oh yeah, fifteen years from now, you fainting and dosing Paul and Benjamin. You know the whole thing. Are you a part of a fucking cynical world? We were dosing people. It doesn't matter. They're always going to find a way to take you down now. <clears throat> you know, they fucking uh, took his job away. This kid didn't hide. He fucking went and shot a special in Austin. Yeah. And, and from there, the gravy train didn't stop. He just kept, he knew exactly what to do. And nobody could tell him he was canceled or nothing. It didn't, it went in one ear and went out the other. What comics? We don't need the fucking system at all. We use I mean, the system because we think we don't need the system. When you first got into comedy, you got into comedy because there was a guy with a fucking brick wall and a microphone. It wasn't because fucking Adam Sandler did 2,000 movies. If that's why you're getting into stand-up and tell me you want to be a tour manager, you know, you want to do world tours. No, you're not. Because in the meanwhile, you want to be Adam Sandler. And I'm not mad at you. But there's a guy that went up there and, you know, his jokes weren't. I mean, to me, I was dying. His, he, he, it was great. I love when people push a joke and then they believe in it. Whether you laugh or not, they're laughing. That burns people. People get especially the people in that room. Oh, yeah. The band behind him was pissed. The band and the, the poor gay Chinese guy with the fucking, <laughs> you know, every time Chappelle went on, let's see where Yang is. You know, this guy went on. Let's see. You know, who gives a fuck? We're comics. What the fuck is going on? What the fuck has been forgotten? What has been forgotten? What has happened to not only comedy, television, the last five, six fucking years? Everybody's had ammunition out for everybody. You can't do nothing. 
Poor Joy Corey, a month ago, fucking, you know, went up there. Oh, my God. For two weeks, they dragged him in the mud. Little did they know he was about to sell out the forum two nights in a row. And all that, all that fucking publicity made him sell 2,000 more fucking tickets, or 10,000 in his fucking world. So, you know, these people love to, every time they point a finger, they haven't learned from Andrew Dice Clay. They never learned. What's that? You don't like Lee? You don't like Joey Diaz? Shut the fuck up. If you know they're going to be on a show, don't watch it. But for you to watch it and then fucking say how they ruined the show. Listen, I've always believed one thing, and I'll state it right now with anybody gets mad or gives a fuck. There's the improv in L.A., there's the Laugh Factory, and there's the Comedy Store. And I truly believe this. The improv is a great company. They're a great company. I love working Melrose and across the... They made me who I am today, the improvs. I'm not going to lie to you. I worked a lot of their rooms. The Laugh Factory was great to me. I always liked Jamie. When, when I first moved to L.A., I went in there and did fucking Monday nights every Monday, 20 minutes, $25. That was $100 a month. That was big in my world when I walked into Jamie's. But I always believed one thing. I don't know if I ever said this or not. I don't give a fuck. When you pass through the comedy store, not on a Tuesday night to do the belly room with Lulu the Magician, I'm talking about when you're in the original room banging out with these fucking animals and you're in the main room banging out with the fucking animals. And again, I say the main room loosely because my first seven years in the main room, I fucking, my percentages were 10% of doing well in that. I would bomb just on nerves and whoever was in front of me or whatever. But I'm going to tell you what I believed then what I believe now. It made me a comedy Marine. And the people who were in there at the time when I was in there were comedy Marines. What does that mean? We go in when nobody else could fix it. <laughs> okay? They send the Navy in. They send the fucking Army in. They send the fucking Air Force in. But now we need some fucking grunts. Grunts who know how to work for laughter. They're not the best looking guys. <laughs> You're not going to get no fucking hosts out of there. You know, America's Funniest Videos was 30 years ago with Bob Saget. It's not going to be pretty, and it's not going to be clean, but they're going to give you 100%. And I know this because just being at the store would make me go on sets, and it would make me feel the same way. I got to show these motherfuckers who I am. It got you in that mindset, and that's how I've always felt about it, whether people agree with me or they fucking don't. Look at the people that came out of the store. Look at the people before me that came out of the store from Hicks to Kennison to Dice. Just that combination right there tells you that comedy store was developed for savages like myself. People who don't give a fuck. People that either they could have been a comedian, a criminal in a prison, or a mental patient. That's the three outlooks of people like me. <laughs> but I knew that going in. So... <laughs> And what was the most likely one? Suck my dick and call me shorty. I was born in 1940. You know what I'm saying? Fuck it. And 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 what is how does this make you relate to Shane? When I saw Shane on Saturday night on an American fucking stage, the biggest fucking television show on a Saturday, it reminded me that he was bringing comedy back single handedly. He reminded everybody what I already fucking knew. Listen, man. I loved that I joined jujitsu 10 years ago. And I fucked around with it and I didn't know what I was doing. I was scared. And the bottom line, it was it was very hard. It was very hard. And you know, Lee, I, I do everything. I would fucking lift weights. You were right there with me. And it's hard work. And that's why I stuck to it, because it, it reminds you of whenever somebody says to me, well, he's got a, a Taekwondo background or boxing <laughs> background. When they say jujitsu, he's got two stripes on his black belt. That's a six year black belt or whatever the fuck it is. Right. This guy's worked for that. I could see that guy in a gym on a Saturday with the windows fogged up, you know, and, and fucking he's in there wrestling on puddles of fucking sweat. I know what it takes to, to do that. I always loved my comedy career because I saw 
too many people that went to Montreal, got a big deal, came to LA and ate a bag of dicks and then never saw them again. Or, and then afterward, then it became the YouTube people and all these people <clears throat> that I love when people just go do stand up and they think they're going to go out there and do it. Listen, you're going to get some laughs. But the 20 years I put in with 30, you know, I started hitting when I was 50. You know, the 20 years I put in before I hit, that alone would have killed most people. Right. Because it just wasn't uh, stand up and I had checks coming to me. It was stand up with a divorce and anger issues and fucking uh, being broke. And it, it was a ton of shit that I I couldn't do without stand up. Stand up was the only beacon in this fucking death that I was creating for myself. But I know one thing, like, that's why when I do videos or when I'm on a set, I'm, I take pride that I'm fucking good at what I'm doing. They don't have to tell me twice. <clears throat> you don't even have to tell me. You don't even have to tell me. I'll be there without you telling me. And I got that from being at that store. But it was because I would look at the people that rocked the house in front of me before that. David Letterman was a store guy. Bob Saget, God rest his soul, was a store guy. You know, Jim Carrey. I fucking love that. And every time, as a comic, every time I walked in there, I felt like I was in a church. It was my church, you know? It was... And we, it, I think it came out right as we left LA, but that store documentary on Showtime was uh, fucking awesome. It was very good. You know, it was very, I just have, I'm just happy they highlighted the store. They let people know what was really going on there. But listen, that's every comedy club that you've ever worked at. Every comedy club has their highs and their lows. And then a star comes out of there. You know, somebody goes to L.A. and makes it big. And, you know, it's such a fucking great feeling. You know what I'm saying? So I hope that a lot of people learned something from Saturday night. These fucking critics and these Internet critics and all these people who think they have the right to, you know, well, Shane's joke failed miserably in a fucking room. You weren't even in the fucking room, bitch. And it didn't sound like it was like it, it sounded like unless they like did something, but it sounded great. And then it like did, it didn't matter, dog. He made his fucking point. And some of the sketches he was in was a little when my wife went upstairs. The only fucking problem I had was later on it got a little raunchy and my daughter was still up with me. And I was oh, hoping wow. that I, the 12 o'clock honeymooners episode was good. But the fucking 1230 wasn't, so I couldn't keep it there. So I had no choice but to go back to fucking uh, Saturday, Night know, Live. Saturday Night Live. But that was the only complaint I had uh, when they fucked the plastic doll or something. Her little head I, looked like, you know, it looked like it was going to blow the fuck up. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't. I would have no idea what to do with that at 11. But I, I only made it, really, I made it through a couple of sketches. I thought the... We watched the actually we watched the monologue at the club, which was great, and it was dying, it was killing in the room. Um, but like as a young comic, what I take from it is like I'm sure Shane would have done great if he if they got to be on SNL, but I don't even think he can argue that his career is a thousand times better than it would have been. Better without no communism in it, you know, without having somebody looking over you. You get drunk in New York, NBC gets a call. No, I don't want that. I'm as free as a bird. And when comedians realize that, listen, man, Eddie Griffin told me the greatest story of all time, the greatest thing. He said, you got into comedy not to have a job. <laughs> yeah. It and like and Shane, I don't know if you saw, but they announced he has a TV show today and an, another special. Yeah. That's it. Game one. It's over. All the people who oh he hates and but listen. I've always told you something. Money talks and bullshit walks. Money talks and bullshit walks. Now what I hope is this shows the country that edgy comics could be mainstream. And some of the comics 
that they don't want to use for TV and they don't want to use in projects. One of the reasons they don't want to use them is because they'll outshine their fucking people. And that's not good when you come to me and, and you're fucking little bummy, greasy. That's, listen, I've always said it. I did the podcast two years ago and I spoke about it. Comics have been removed from the biggest forum. There's, there's, there's 500 channels. When you turn on cable, how many fucking cable channels are there? A million. A million. And there's 30 comics working. And I mean guys that are raw, guys that are funnier than half these fucking Harvey homo types they put on TV to fucking soothe white America. It's got to end. Listen, man, I don't know if you remember this. This is a good story for the people at home in Young Comics. One of the best clubs in the country is Wise Guys Comedy Club. Mm -hmm. The one in Utah is one of my favorite clubs in the country. If I was touring, I would still be going there. If I had to pick my... 10 favorite clubs, I would still be going there. The guy that owns it, it's a great guy. I've known him since the late 90s on triple tours. That guy's busted his ass. I think he's got four rooms now. I think he's got two in Utah and one in Vegas. He opened. I think he might have two in Vegas, to be honest. Yeah, two in Vegas. The guy's doing great. You know, I asked my agent when I first got to CAA, I go, what's going on with that club in Utah? And he goes, I talked to that guy from time to time. He's just a little scared. You know, last time he put somebody dirty in there, the Chamber of Commerce got a bunch <laughs> of letters and all this shit. And he's always been a little touchy. You know, he does good with magicians and people with tambourines and shit like that. <laughs> and I remember driving through Utah and seeing that club, I don't know for what. I think it was me and Rogan for some commercial. I, I don't know. And I was like, that's a nice fucking club. And I told my agent to call him. He'll call this motherfucker and tell him this podcast has changed the game. People want to hear these motherfuckers. The people that Comedy Central's pushing, nobody wants to hear them. Right. There was a handful of comics that needed to get the fuck out there. And I hate to say this, I was one of them. What do you they mean? Needed to get out there. That was their time. Now, you could you could stop fucking selling your fucking boring ass people. There's a whole list of comics that are doing podcasts that are starting to come up in a different way. They're starting to open up their lives, something that's never been done before. Talk about their addictions, going to prison, their fears. It's a different type of comic coming up now. We were doing podcasts, and all those guys in our neighborhood, from Ari to Brian to Bert to Tom, that was early 2012, Lee, 2013. Yeah. Like 2014, we were rocking and fucking rolling for us, for who we were. It was the Rogan Satellite Hemisphere. We had Mark Marin fucking throwing heat. Mark's still throwing heat, you know, and there was a bunch of young comics coming up. Our podcast was coming up. Ari's was coming up. Red Bands was coming up. Ice House Chronicles were coming up. Yeah, and those were fun days. And it was a fun period. It was a very fun period. And we grew like no other fucking group of comics ever. That was a, a spectacular fucking growth, you know? As a fan, it was fun. Like, I remember, like, those Ice House Chronicles and then, like, the early Rogan. Like, that's how I found you was early Rogan. And then, like, early... Even all of, all of your guys' podcasts, because you guys were just you know you were guests on it, but like not like there was all every story was new and we there was never anything like it. So like I, I would love to know more about as a comic what it was like. What did it feel like back then? It was great to. It was great that my agent was caught. Now, 2012, I start in '91. Mm-hmm. So how many years am I in the game now? In two thousand, well, when was Mercy born? Two thousand twenty-one. So twenty-one years I'm in the game, and I'm telling this. This guy signs me. I do. I did a bunch of one-nighters. I think you came with me with Felicia to Cobbs. We did a bunch of one-nighters, me and Felicia, and I sold out Cobbs. And I'm like, <laughs> and then I went out there and bombed. But it was podcast people. 
They wanted to hear the wig story, drug stories. This is way back. And I still remember my agent, I'm telling them, call this guy. Like to bust people's balls that didn't like me. (laughs) And it was still like, nah, we don't know. We don't know. Last time he was here, he fucking did this. He hasn't been here in 15 years, but last time he was here, he did this. And it was always some fucking pushback. <laughs> and then he, the guy would hear something. The guy would hear from another club owner. Duncan Trussell was here, and he sold out the whole fucking weekend. Something's going on with those guys. And then I started, like they started, but the money was real low. Okay. And then, like, I would go in there, sell 200 tickets a night, five nights. That's a lot of tickets when you can't sell a fucking ticket. A thousand tickets on a weekend? It's a lot of tickets, even though you didn't sell out of the show. The room well, was 250. Whenever it was, let's just say 2010. How many tickets were you selling a weekend? 18. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big difference. 18. And that was after the longest yard. So don't believe the fucking hype. The longest yard just let them know. 2010, I got married in 2009. I was already thinking of bailing. And then I think 2010 is when Felicia came along. And we started the podcast. It went for about three months and nobody knew nothing. We couldn't get a sponsor. And then I told the story about mugging the hooker and lighting a wig on fire. And I booked Sal's Comedy Hall on 10-10-2010. And it's Sunday night. It's a quarter to seven. The show starts at eight. And I'm on the 101 South. I'm eight minutes away. And my phone's ringing. And he's telling me to hurry up down there because we got a line around the corner. And I'm like, just fucking tell me that, you know, don't no tell me there's a line around the corner. He goes, no. We sold 150 tickets. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I'm telling you, man, there's a bunch of people down here. And I went down and I was in shock and I ate a bag of dicks. Because of, oh, I bombed badly. 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 Were you nervous? I really wasn't. Listen, at that time, my podcasting was way ahead of my stand up. I had brushed off stand-up. I was only doing stand-up on the weekends at the Ha Ha with D'Agostino. Yeah, that's when we met. Yeah. He was 20 years old, 21. And I was going over there on Fridays and Saturdays. Remember when I took you down in the hooker with the black eye or something, tried to hit a on bandage you? bandage on her head. Yeah. A bandage on her head. Only fucking Lee Syatt. So You left me. I did. I wanted but, you to put my, what, threes are fucking crowd. Did you get the memo, cocksucker? But don't leave me with a woman with a bandage no, on her head. No, 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 don't, 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 don't. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> so I try to hit on the chick. She's a young hooker. She wanted to suck your little dick. But so I didn't even know she was a hooker. I thought what? she. I, I, I didn't know she was a hooker at the time. Then you, then you smell her neck. She smelled like you with the hummus. I didn't know I wouldn't smell her neck. Who smells someone that you go to jail for smelling someone's neck? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> even a hooker, they want like, you can't smell. Oh my God. But yeah, this woman, I guess since we're telling it, we were, it was like right after I met you. Cause we, when we first started, I would just come meet you at the haha. Yeah. We'd sit outside, you eat a, like a box or two of Mike and Ike's, and you would smoke like a puff out of one cigarette and then throw it away. And then... <laughs> <laughs> but it was, we would just sit on like the furniture and just talk. And then one night, this woman like came stumbling up Lancashire, which is like, not Skid Row, but like the Skid Row of the Valley. Like it was creepy up there sometimes. That time it was very creepy. And there was a woman with a bandage on her head, and I guess she was a hooker. I don't. I I just thought she was a crazy person with a band, and she was just talking crazy. She just got out of the hospital, and then we were just sitting there talking. I'm probably 24, 23, and like I don't know if you've even given me an edible yet. I think maybe we'd smoke bong heads. I'm just yeah, so be- naive. I didn't want to throw you to the wolves. I didn't want you to pack. Well, yeah, but home. then you leave me six months into LA with a woman with a bandage on her head, well, and she's like, and she starts talking about you want to go see a movie, you want to go, and I was like, yeah, I don't want to bring that's, it. that's what people do. Yeah, listen, if it was a faggot with a big dick, I wouldn't have left you. <laughs> it was a woman with a bandage on her head. 
What do you want from me? You know what I'm saying? Give me a heads up that I, I shouldn't. That. I went to get a drink with her. I didn't know she was a hooker. She kept saying How about much things. How she asked you for? I, I don't remember the money, but she said what happened was, and I can't believe I did it because you would think I'd pay for it, but we went to that bar. I think it was called Skinny's across the street. Across the street. She got a glass of wine. I got one drink, and she asked me to dance, and I've danced one entire time with her. I, I don't dance at a bar. Especially not back then. And she leaned in. And she's like, "I'll make you feel like the sexy, sexiest man alive." And I was chubby, like I was always chubby. And I was like, "I don't pay for like." I, and I walked out, and I paid that. I didn't even look at her. Like when you were talking about being in the zone, I was in the zone. I was running out of that bar because I was uh, like, just the fact that she asked me that, I was like, "The cops are here." I would have gone to the ATM if I was you and just paid her just for the story. See if she had a bandage on her ass. What, the first time I got herpes? What do you mean? What kind of story? She had a bandage on her head. So what? That's <laughs> the story. Who came? Whoever came to you and said, I just banged a chick who had a bandage on her head. She just I don't want that to be my story. She escaped from the mental hospital. You could have oh, taken her right to that little... She probably lived at that fucking hotel on the corner down the block. You know, That's what people don't understand is we lived in North Hollywood in Studio City. And it was always supposed to be nice on this <laughs> inside, on the outside. But the inside of it, no, I used to see one of my first months in the valley. I was driving down Lancashire, and I see a chick with a robe with fucking flip-flops running down <laughs> Lancashire. And two minutes later, I see some Mexican guy chasing her from the hotel. She robbed him. She was a hooker. Oh, Jesus. And she robbed him. And I'm like, you know, now I know he's going to kill her. But I know, I know, I know she's pick up, you know, I know she's gonna pick up a prostitution charge and a theft charge. So I had a crime stop. So I just said a prayer for her and kept driving. Usually I see a chick getting chased. I try to hit the guy with the car or something, block him off. But I knew she had the wallet in her hand. She was oh. running down the street. It had to be fucking seven fifteen in the morning, Lee. And you know, because of my experiences in New York City and other cities lurking at night. I, I know shit happens at 6 in the morning. So here I am on the up and up. I don't know. I think I was going to get blood. And all of a sudden, I'm just, it's a beautiful day to be alive. And a chick comes running past me with flip-flops and a robe. And not two minutes later, Pancho V is chasing her with a knife and fucking. And you just kept going one to get blood taken? What do we want me to do? I don't know. I just imagined you would use it as like a. Saber all of a sudden. I got a cape in my oh. car. I don't know where that Mexican guy came from. I don't know. He maybe he's got a knife. Maybe he's got two knives. Maybe he don't like Cuban people. But yeah. I ain't gonna find out. They were playing in a hooker hotel, and they get what they deserve. You understand? <laughs> They're playing in one. What is it, Judge Joey? And I'm fucking making decisions of what goes on in the hooker hotel. <laughs> yeah, it, it, dude. I lived on my second apartment in L.A. was Sherman Way and Sepulveda. For people, it's like deep, deep, deep in the valley. And I would drive down Sepulveda to go to, to work. And at like 7 in the morning, it looked like Grand Theft Auto hookers. It was like people, like I've never seen a hooker on the street before. I never saw them up there in that other street. They were always on that street never, every morning. Yeah, I didn't go up there except to fucking bring my car to service. So, you know. It was every morning, and it was crazy. I was, and then one time, one they pulled up to a gas station, I think, to get condoms or something, like a dude who looked like me with a like a, a, a hooker. And, I, like, the L.A. is full. Of, I can't imagine what it's like now. It's funny. We weren't into that world. Thank God. You know, where we were. No. First of all, you got to let people know the Valley is the capital porn. Mm -hmm. It's where they make fucking porn. And then... It's also the capital of the massage parlors. Right. And we were surrounded with massage parlors. Now, I'm naive at times. I was naive, but when I was, uh, when I first got into comedy, <clears throat> maybe 95, I was doing the road and I was coming back from Michigan and from driving, my shoulder really hurt, you know, from all those years of shooting baskets. And I kept seeing massage, massage, massage on the drive back. And I said, fuck it, I'm going to check to a hotel, but I'm going to go get a massage first. Like I had driven like 11 hours or something. 
<clears throat> I remember I checked into the hotel. You know, it was like a fucking n- nothing exciting, you know. And then I went and got something to eat, and then I went to the massage parlor. And I remember when I walked in the door, there was incense burning. There was Chinese music burning. And I'm like, okay. You know, Chinese music was on. And I'm like, okay. And all of a sudden, some girl comes out that was Chinese, no Americanized, very cute, very cute. You know, if I was 30-something, she had to be 29 or something. And she's asking me what I want. I go, my shoulder, you know. That's it. That's all I wanted, for somebody to rub up my shoulder, maybe balance. Yeah. They put me in the back room. They got to get naked and get on the table. And I'm already like, what are you talking about? Right. I'm not getting fucking naked. So, you know, I thought it was going to be her. Dog, they sent in this fucking Asian chick that had to be 55. Hair was all fucked up. She still had noodles in her teeth. <laughs> it smelled like fucking soy sauce. You know, she was like the cook. And she came in. Right. There. She didn't even massage me. She's like, listen, TTT, and then $40 hand job. And I thought about it for a minute. I'm like, Forty dollars for a fucking hand job. You got some fucking nerve. <laughs> I go, that's it. Forty for a fucking sucky fucky. No, no, no. Hand job, hand job. Listen, I wouldn't have paid for a fucking sucky fucky. I didn't have the money. I didn't have I, I was just picking up three hundred and fifty dollars and I had to drive back. But I remember going, like, I gotta go. Like I just put my shit on and ran out of that. Forty dollars for a hand job. Are you fucking crazy? You can do that yourself. Right. I'm going to put that soy sauce hand on my dick and fucking make my dick salty. God knows if you ever had a manicure or a fucking pedicure or whatever the fuck they do back there. But And that's when I knew. I like I didn't know those fucking things were hand job play. People tell me about those places around here, happy endings. The, the last thing I ever want is a fucking hand job. And it, you imagine it, laying there getting a hand job and the cops come in there. How bad would you feel? How embarrassed would you feel for your family? But on top of that, I just don't want a fucking hand job. I don't ever want a fucking hand job. If you're going to sell me on anything, don't sell me on a fucking hand job. You got to be a lot more creative. You got to go for the guts with Uncle Joey. Fucking when, hand job. How, how would you be creative with sex? There's like three things you could do. Tell me you're going to blow an arrow up my ass with fire on it and suck it out of my dick. I don't know. You know, stun me a little bit. I'll suck your dick so much, you'll fucking, your, your eyes will pop out of your head. Show me like an eye patch and go, I have a lot of them because every time I suck a guy's dick on it, he loses an eye. But it's worth it. You have one eye, but, and I, that's a sales thing. I want to lose an eye. Have you seen like the streets in Thailand? No. Oh, dude, they, that's what they do there. No, I, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go I'm there. not saying you're going to go to Thailand. I'm, I'm saying a fucking beautiful 18-year-old chick, and next thing you wake up, and she's got a wig on, and she's got a bigger <laughs> dick than fucking you, and she's doing bad things to you, and there's a little kid in the corner playing the drums, and there's a <laughs> white dude with a camera. You know what I'm saying? I don't think we're ever doing SNL. Whenever people tell me they go going to Thailand, I get a little weary. Like, all of a sudden, I smell like tears and perversions and God knows what. Because, you know, even if you're in a room with three chicks, there's got to be some fat fucking guy like me in a room two doors down with two five-year-olds playing ping pong naked. <laughs> you know, that's not what I want to fucking see. I don't even want to be in that building. I don't want to no. be around. What? I don't even want to no, be in that building. of course building. not. I don't want to be around when Mike the Archangel comes around and just shoots lasers in those motherfuckers. I don't have time for that nastiness. Right. I'm, uh... I, I don't want that either, but if they have, like, the prostitution is a like, part of what, like, there's big, and they have videos of, like, women going, like, being aggressive like that. But, no, that does sound pretty awful. You watch those videos, Lee? You got fucking problems. You no, I don't look terrible. for it. I know you don't look for it, but you still watch them and shit. That's disturbing. Yeah, there's some disturbing shit on Half the internet. those women are fucking whatever. They, they either stitch a dick on. They don't even use a strap on. They just wait till one of their comrades goes down. And they just cut it off and s- stick it on like a pogo stick and take their chances. Do you ever watch porn? No. Because I got to, really, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this. I'm too I'm old. Gonna, okay. And 
I don't know. Lee, I don't have a, I have one Playboy magazine in my house. I have one disgusting magazine in my house. And it's the one with Hollywood Henderson. The story oh, okay. of Hollywood Henderson. Serge Ortega sent that to me, you know, 15 years ago. Right, I'm not, I remember that. I'm not, I'm not into any of that shit at all. At all. I don't know why. Listen, and again, I like looking at a chick's hairy asshole. You know, I like looking at titties and all this shit. It's that's what we do. Right. Dog, I love women. I fucking love women. Love them. Love everything about them. Everything. They all make me laugh in different ways, different sizes. They all they all have some type of something that you want. <clears throat> but I can't be in those places. <clears throat> they make me feel like if I'm in a strip club, I feel like fucking. I went to dinner Friday night. Okay. And the table two down from me were four guys, anywhere from 40 to 45, expensive watches, these fucking suits that they all look tailored and they're all the same. Right. Glad, and they all had the brown shoes on. And they're all dolled up. It's just four guys. And they're in there doing whatever they do, being a little loud. You know, they wanted people to look at them. I understand. But after a couple minutes, I'm like, what are these four fucking idiots doing here? You know? And you know what I thought it reminded me of? When I used to do comedy at the Diamond Cabaret. What Diamond was that? Cabaret is a strip club in Denver. In Denver. And when they first opened in 95, they used to have comics come down on Monday night or something. And I always noticed one thing. Like, I was very fortunate. They hired me, and then they give me a steak. And I would eat the steak on the fucking rail. I would eat the steak in a table farthest from the stage. But there was these idiots that would get that fucking 20-ounce with a baked potato, and, and, they, and the place was gorgeous. And they'd sit there in their fucking suits and they'd eat. And when the girls would come over, they would go, no, 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 no. We're here for business. I'll go over there and I'll, <laughs> I'll throw this chair over your head. Why are you doing that to this girl? She's fucking beautiful. I mean, this Diamond Cabaret had CU students, Denver. I mean, they had the baddest motherfucking girls you ever saw in your life. That place and the other place across town, not Choku Charlie's in Alaska. But there's a place in Denver that it, it's known. And that Diamond Cabaret. And, and But I saw 20 of those guys. And every time I go there, like once a month until I left, they were always there. Not the same dudes, but the same act. <clears throat> we're here for business. Then why the fuck are you sitting on the railing? And why are you making believe? And then the girls would come over and sit on their lap. And he would flirt with her and... They talk about a boat deal. Why would you say that in front of these fucking girls? All four fucking dickless dudes, right? Right. Just tell the girl, listen, I got a, what boat? What boat? I got two G's in my pocket. Let's go in the private room and let me suck champagne out of your fucking monkey or your titties. Or, that's it. But they sit there like trying to impress them. And it's so weird. That shit drives me fucking crazy when guys get dressed up to go to a strip club but they're there on business. I want to see the guy that's got, as he's walking in, you can see a little puddle in his pants. Like he already came just thinking about him. He was, when he walked in, he smelt the fucking, that Greek pussy in the air, and he gave him that ID. <laughs> he had a little jizz on his fucking pants. Whew. But so, you don't, I'm sorry. What happened? But you don't like strip clubs. Listen, I just told you, I love women. I love to see naked women. I love to see women in heels, not those plastic strip club heels. They make me feel like the women don't wash their feet, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> Whenever I go to a strip club, I always worry about the women's feet because they wear those leather boots up to their fucking above their knees. Right. I know as a kid, you know, if I dressed up like Batman and I had my boots on <laughs> and I took off my little fucking boots... Right. But well, that calf and that foot would stink for fucking 10 days. You know, so while I'm there watching them dance, I'm like, what if she takes that boot off? <laughs> I'm like, I'm fucking dead. So I don't like none of those dress up places. 
Come out with heels. I want to check you out. I want to make sure you got no lice. Come out with heels and fucking the bikini on. I don't want to see nothing else. You want to well, dress like cat woman, do that on your thigh. Why are you why are you worried about it? Uh, you think that her feet are gonna smell? I don't know. Listen, after I smell my own feet, I don't trust nobody no more. You understand me? I looked at my foot today in jujitsu. It's like mm-hmm. the fungi toenail grows every fucking day in a different direction. Tonight, I finish here. I got to go out there and watch the fucking game. and Cut my fucking toenail tonight. Unbelievable. So I always feel that everybody else's feet are going to be fucked up. It's not my feet that smell. It's the fungi toenail mixed with the fucking, you know. But anyway, back to naked women. I love them. The problem, <laughs> I, just don't, I just don't want to go to a fucking strip club. I get it. But it's how, where do you see it if you're not looking at porn? In my mind. Okay, that's where you just go back and you... No, I just, I don't need to... I don't need to look at that shit. Right. Every goddamn day. I'm okay with a bikini shot from time to time. I'm 61. What's the fantasy about now? That I'm going to show up at their house and show them my balls and they're going to they promise to say, ooh, it's beautiful. No, you just fucking shattered my hopes and dreams. Because you saw my dick at 61, you're not going to get married, though. You know? <laughs> I would never do that to anybody, Lee. I'm not that type of person. You think they'd just give up if they saw your dick right now? They'd do something. <laughs> any shit. woman, any 22-year-old, any 30-year-old that saw a 60-year-old dick and balls, that's not good for them. That's not good for them. What the, what happens when you turn sixty? When it's when I turn fifty, I smell the odors. I saw what the balls look like. <laughs> it's a different game. You have drippage off your little turtleneck. <laughs> what because for years? If if pee came out of my hole, it would get <laughs> caught in the turtleneck, and I would drain it like a fucking like a massage bag. Those people <laughs> that bag on their shit. A colostomy bag. Yeah, colostomy bag. But then as I got older, I don't know the the, the rubber. The rubber band and the turtleneck, something happened to it. So, you know, life changes. Fuck, that's terrifying. But speaking, I uh, I didn't want to forget. I, but we were you were talking about like Seattle earlier. You, you put up a you sent me a pretty cool picture this weekend. Yes, I did. Put it up. Let's put it up. Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I came like I guess maybe on a bigger screen it's a little bit more noticeable. But like when you sent me that, I was like, oh shit, Rita O looked good. <clears throat> Rita O was the original. What everybody's trying to be today and be a fake about, Rita O did it in 1960. Rita O was Japanese and Irish. Oh, okay. Uh, she was born a man and she decided to have the operation, dick, tits, the whole thing. She changed the headline. She did that. Put the picture back up. I get emotional when I look at it. Uh, you know, she changed everything. And yeah, it, it fucked her up. She was like four foot nine. Really? Ooh. Oh, Jesus, Joey. She was, did you hear it? Yeah. No, of course I heard it. Your neighbors heard it. <laughs> <laughs> she was like four foot nine and she used to wear heels and she got dialed up every night of the fucking week. She had to, you know, look at it. She looks like fucking God knows what. She looks like, I don't even know. But she was a sweet woman. You know, I loved her. I ain't going to lie to you. I fucking loved her. She made me laugh harder than a lot of fucking people on the natural. You know, the night we got coked up and she got thrown out of the club for being dirty in Seattle. And she goes, I'm going to report them. And I go, call the White House. And this bitch did. (laughs) What? She kept calling the White House over and over. I want to talk to the president at four in the morning, coked out of her mind. Holy shit. And, uh, you know, we just had a blast. She died because she was a man and she became a woman. But, like, you see the side of her head? In the picture, it looks small, but that's a big fucking watermelon. And she was four foot nine. So that's a big head to have on that little frame. Right. 
and she would fall like uh like Willy Wonka. What what's those things? The Oompa-loompas? She would fall like a weeble oh. in the weirdest places, and then she fell like three times in two years on her head. She was on a speaker at a gay club up in uh, Capitol Hill, jumping up and down, and she fell off the speaker. She was buck wild. She you was fell buck- and she would still get on the speaker. Why would she get on the speaker? I, listen, because they're fucking out of their minds. But I loved her. She gave me my first money to get headshots. Oh, that's nice. In Seattle. Um, was she a good comic? She had more balls than half the people today. Because like I said, she was working from a different place. She was working from being real. She cut her dick off. She wasn't one of these guys that was still walking around slinging dick and fucking assholes and you know so yeah. i don't know what the rules are and stuff but i loved rita o. rita o opened up my world to a you know she told me about her world and she told me how much she suffered and she was like on fucking 22 medications because of what came with the surgery really you know when you go to, when you go to the doctor and you go to the pharmacy you come home with one container of 20 pills. Think of coming home with 30 containers. When she'd go to the pharmacy and come back on the first or the second, it was like a fucking grocery bag, guys. And this was what year? 90 what? 93, 94? 96. I became. I met her in 95. We would be at the open mics on Monday and we would steal her nachos. Oh, yeah. She would lose her mind. Put them down. <laughs> it's because she must have been one of the first people to have the surgery. It's really weird because I see her and I'm at peace when I saw that picture. And I'll tell you why. Because she was sick of being an open micer and all she wanted to do was do a gig with somebody. And I would take her to be my opener, even though I knew there was going to be drama. Even really? though she was going to curse somebody out. It made me laugh my ass off. I didn't give a fuck if they wouldn't bring me back. I mean, these like these one night of bars, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They weren't like Madison Square Garden or the improv. So I would bring her. They'd give her like 25 bucks and dog just to see people's reaction. I would bring her to watch her and I would learn. I would watch the audience. And then she would have a joke that she really cut her dick off and it's in a jar. And it was. She oh this God. chick was great. This guy, this this God rest his or her soul. That's all I want to fucking say. <clears throat> I'm very sorry too. Uh all right, you can bring the picture down. I'm getting all sentimental and shit. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh I'm very sorry that we didn't talk about your sets at the Providence. That's okay. Uh, um Comedy you know, Connection. Comedy Connection. It's a fucking great club, is it not? It was, a, dude. It was one of, the, and I, I've been like, bro, that the little club. room is fucking fire. Yeah, it was a fun. It's it's very small, and all for he, the guy who I opened for, Zach Fox, great. Sold out four straight shows, and like, so it was full. Like, and I've done the room. The only other time I did it, it was probably like half full, and it was still pretty fun. But like, sold out. Every audience was really cool, and they were young. And I hosted, which I have bombed usually hosting. I usually I have not done well hosting, and this was my best weekend hosting. You I think. keep doing it, and you get good at it. And now you become more of a quarterback. You see what I'm talking about? If the the headliner is very clean, and the mm-hmm. feature act is dirty, you do an extra minute or two, and you keep it clean, so the headliner doesn't have to walk into that disaster. Interesting. There's so, so I- many fucking things that I was watching um, Ray a okay. month ago. The last hour when that guy comes on and he was at the country, he was at the in, in Georgia or somewhere, <clears throat> and the lights were on, and the guy came on and said, Lower the lights and raise the and at the end of the show, he goes, Who did that? And he goes, I did. He goes, Who told you to do it? He goes, No, it needed to be done. Right. That's what, you know. Anyway. Did but did you ever because my only thing that I would be nervous of is like as a post, I'm like extra conscious of like time and not doing time between people. And I didn't no, need to no, do it no, this no, weekend, no. but listen, man, being a host is back to 
back to rule number one of comedy that you're never going to learn after you've been doing it at least 20 years. And that's be yourself. You're never going to learn or understand what that is. I can hire a computer, right? AI is coming. Right. Oh, yeah, it's here. Okay. So I can hire a guy to go up there and do 12 minutes of material and three minutes of ads to the T on time. And then in between, he could just go up and go, keep it going for Paul Harvey. Don't forget, he's selling stuff after the show. All right, let's give a big round of applause for the wait staff. Don't forget to tip these girls, Louise, Melissa, Tony, Johnny the Black Dude. You know, <laughs> you're giving the room color now, right? Right. And then you could, j- or you could just go up there and go do that and go, don't forget, Joey Diaz is here May 28th. And Paulie Shore is here <clears throat> May 25th. Or not out to the show. I can hire a fucking robot to do that. Right. I want you to go up there and play with him. See what's happening. How you guys doing? Welcome to the Comedy Connection. My name is Uncle Joey here. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? Any parties? Birthdays? And at first, they'll get like a little shock. But they're East Coast people. They feel you. Boom, boom, boom. Listen, don't forget, you, you ever see Carlos Mencia? You ever see fucking, uh, fucking what's his name? He's going to be here Memorial Day weekend. All right, anyway, listen, you know what happened to me last Memorial Day weekend? I did one of those fucking Xanaxes, and I thought, you know, whatever. Right. Whatever. I did an edible, and I passed out. And, and now when you go up there, let's say this feature act bombs. Okay. You can't leave that fucking headliner with that. You can't just go up there and go, Let's keep it going. That was a great set. And they're like, boo, we just lost credibility. Why are you lying to us? The guy just got hit with 22 tomatoes in 20 minutes. You know what I'm saying? He failed the test. And then you, you can't just bring up the headliner. Okay. Do something. And now you got that two-minute bit that you can bounce off who's coming this weekend, what the weather, something. You got that two-minute bit that you'll learn how to, and it's just got the par- all party started. It's Saturday night, folks. We got one more headline. He's tremendous. I know you all want to get out of here. You want to lick mama's monkey. That's if the headline is fucking dirty. Okay. The headline is clean. You got to be yourself and be funny. And this is when your own natural funny comes out. But we don't know that. Don't think that I knew that 15 years ago. I'm lying to you if I tell you I did. I learned that maybe five years ago looking back at things. Right, because I, I I I still am not playing like doing. Not, you weren't doing crowd work, but like I I don't really interact as much as I should. No, as a host, go out there. No, I want you to go out there and bang them. I don't want you to ask people where they're from or what they. No, do. I don't. I never do that. Or, or who are you married to? What do you eat for? Di- no, if you're gonna say something, it's good. You tell them something, dog. Where'd you get that fucking wig from? Anyway, you know, and, and you go back whether they feel it or not. But remember, if they don't feel it, now you got to dig yourself out of two holes. Right. So your words got to be banged. And you know what? That's what this whole thing is about, is digging yourself out of holes. So just say whatever's on your mind. I got to take two steps to the rear and get out of here. You know what I'm saying? We've been here talking shit for how long? It's Tuesday morning. People don't want to hear this nonsense. Love you, buddy. I love you, too. Have a great week. And now for a word from our motherfucking sponsor, Jacko. The check-in is brought to you by Lucy. Let me ask you something. You ready for a party in your mouth? Well, let Lucy in. Lucy Breakers nicotine pouches have tiny flavor capsules inside them. Pop one in, break the capsule, and get the party started, Jack, with flavors like mint, mango, berry citrus, and espresso. No matter what you like, Lucy has something that you'll love. Listen, so far... I've tried the mint and the berry citrus. Tremendous. Here's the beauty about Lucy. You can get two milligrams is perfect if you don't use nicotine a lot. Eight milligrams will get you going if you use nicotine daily. But they got 12 milligrams for when you really need a quick pick-me-up. You know what I'm saying? So those other brands of pouches just don't do the trick. Listen, do me a favor. Let's level up your nicotine routine with Lucy. Go to lucy.co slash joey. Go to lucy.co 
co slash Joey and press in code Joey to get 20% off your first order. That's 20%. And Lucy offers free shipping and has a 30-day refund policy if you change your mind. That's lucy.co slash Joey. And use code Joey to get 20% off and always free shipping. Now, here comes the fine print. Lucy products only for adults of legal age, and every order is age verified. Warning, the product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. And you know what? That's it, and that's that. Again, go to lucy.co slash Joey, use code Joey, and get 20% off and always free shipping. The check-in is also brought to you by, listen, this is a party-type episode. It's brought to you by Blue Chew. Listen, if you're soft, don't be hard on yourself. Get back in the game with Blue Chew. Uncle Joey, what's Blue Chew? Oh, tremendous. Blue Chew offers the same ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, all at a fraction of a cost. You go to the doctor lately and try to get a prescription for Viagra, you know what they do? They want They want like $80 a pill. No, 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 no. Get ready to save tons of money and have awesome sex. I'm talking about doing backflips, listening to stuff, breaking windows. Blue Chew will also send the ED medicine straight to your door. And listen, I don't even know why they call it ED medicine. They should be calling it love medicine, Jack. Blue Chew is totally online, and you'll get a digital consultation with a physician, a doctor. And then everything is sent right to you in a discreet package. Does it work? Tremendously. You pop a Blue Chew uh, 20 minutes before you want to get the party started, and it's all over. You might as well put a cape on that fucking thing because you're knocking down walls like I don't know like who. Anyway. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. So discover your options at BlueChew.com. Listen, you know what that little motto is? Chew it and then do it. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha. Blue Chew got a special deal for check-in listeners. Try Blue Chew free, free on a Tuesday. Press in code Joey at checkout and just pay $5 for shipping. Who's better than you? Nobody. BlueChew.com, promo code Joey to receive. Your first order free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. Thank you, BlueChew, for sponsoring the podcast. Why safety information? They're going to tell you things you got to get if you're going to eat a BlueChew, like a helmet, stuff like that, like a first aid kit, because you look at Lee's. Look at, anyway, BlueChew.com, promo code Joey to receive your first month. 